Hi everyone, I'm Dale Smith, aka Journo Dale, and we're here to talk about Canadian politics. I have with me over FaceTime Trevin Stratton, the Chief Economist for the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, and I figured we'd talk a little bit about this week's fiscal snapshot. Uh, Trevin, how are you? I'm doing well, how are you, Dale? I'm pretty good. Uh, so, what everyone focused on in this was the big headline numbers around the deficit and the debt. Um, a lot of pearl clutching and reaching for fainting couches over those numbers. I thought I'd get your perspective first on on them and whether or not they are as big of a deal as they sound because we are not in 1995 anymore. Yeah, I mean, so the, the numbers themselves are big. I mean, I, I understand why why they're staggering to, to a lot of people. I mean, you know, let's, let's certainly put it in perspective, first of all, that, um, that this is a, a 12-fold increase in the deficit since the last projection. This is the largest uh, deficit since the Second World War. Um, you know, the, this is the first time Canada has had a national debt over one trillion dollars. Um, you know, so it is. You know, it is. It is big and it is historic. Um, I, I certainly understand that. Um, you know, I. I think one question is um, whether it was needed. I think most economists and, and most Canadians would probably say that yes, a lot of these programs were needed. Um, for fear of the, the economic impact uh, being even worse than what is currently projected, uh, which is, you know, over 6.5% GDP decline this year. Um, I think right. So. I, I think the Scotiabank economics uh, calculation was that if the government had de done nothing, it would have been something like a 10.3% drop of GDP. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, which is also just, just an incredibly uh, large magnitude. And, you know, uh, in March and in April, uh, certainly, you know, one of the biggest concerns was, you know, first of all, uh, individuals were losing their jobs, obviously. Um, and secondly, businesses closing down uh, due to liquidity concerns. Uh, and so, you know, the two biggest programs, um, certainly being CERB and the wage subsidy, um, definitely helped to decrease the economic impact um, of this crisis this year. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, you know, what do we, what do, we do going forward, even though um, some of these programs might have merited, um, you know, how long can they be put in place for? And some of the, I guess, questions related to the numbers that came out yesterday um, is, you know, are, are, are these programs even financially sustainable over the long term or, or maybe even over the medium term? Uh, are, are questions that, that people are asking right now, because these numbers are, are astronomical. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I, I also saw a figure yesterday from economist Jennifer Robson who said, uh, basically, if, if revenues came back to where they were before um, and these programs wound down, the deficit would return to basically about $40 billion. So it seems to me um, that would be kind of like the priority of, of where we want to be going. Yeah, and I, you know, I think that's that's one of the reasons why um, that economic growth is going to be important now, or to be able to build on the momentum of reopening. Um, and certainly, there's an interplay there between some of the programs on being able to build on that momentum. But if, if government revenues are going to go back to, to what they were, um, then we're going to need growth rates that that end up getting back back to that level. Um, certainly what's being projected is that even by the end of 2021, our economy still won't be the same size as it was pre-crisis, but it'll be getting there by that point. Yeah. Um, and so, you, you know, that's, that's, that's somewhat of a silver lining there, at least. Okay. The other thing I, I kind of wanted to talk with you about is this notion about stimulus, because um, whenever there's an economic uh, downturn or crisis, the automatic response is infrastructure. Uh, but we're also hearing a lot that that's not going to help us in this particular situation because A, it's a demand side shock and B, um, those are areas where there's actually very little um, economic downturn happening. Uh, construction projects are were basically the first thing or last thing to close, first thing to open back up, uh, that sort of thing. And um, I thought we'd just explore that a little bit, too. Yeah, no, and, and that's a very good point. And, and you're right. This isn't um, necessarily a financial or an economic crisis like any other. 
uh, you know, oftentimes when we have economic downturns, uh, it's, it's first in, first out when it comes to the sectors that are first impacted. Uh, certainly what we're seeing here is first and last out, particularly when it comes to the service sector, not necessarily the goods producing sector. Um, and, and that's because this is a very different type of economic downturn, right? Um, you know, uh, what we've seen previous declines in demand during economic crises, um, it hasn't been because of concerns about, about physical distance um, yeah. and, and, and businesses that require a physical presence, like some service industries, like the restaurants industry and like retail um, and, and like tourism and, and accommodation. Um, and, and so that's, that's really what we're seeing right now. Uh, and also, I'll, I'll make the point that when it comes to stimulus spending, um, certainly, you know, as, as is often said, we're all Keynesians now, and I understand the um, benefit of countercyclical spending by, by governments. Um, I, I will mention that something that we learned from 2008 um, is that it's really hard to find shovel-ready projects or quote-unquote shovel-ready projects. Um, partially because of our regulatory system, you know, mm-hmm. uh, if, you know, even if you if you uh, provide funding for infrastructure projects, um, we have a, a somewhat burdensome or onerous regulatory system in Canada compared to some other countries. And for projects to go through that process takes a while, and that that doesn't necessarily sound shuffle ready to me. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and the other, uh, I guess, flip side of this is um, one of the biggest, I guess problems that we're, we're facing now in terms of the recovery is child care and education because they're essentially um, keeping women out of the workforce at this point and uh, you know which could mean a, a loss of up to 40 percent of income in in a great many households and so um, it seems to me this is one of these things that we really need to adjust our thinking around when it comes to how to deal with this uh, economic fallout yeah, no, I, uh, I agree completely, and, and the Canadian Chamber of Commerce has certainly been um, looking into what we need to do on child care when, when it comes to recovery. Um, you know, as employees continue to return to work, either remotely or on-site, um, there are kind of a variety of hybrid models within there, but the key to successful work reintegration and economic recovery for parents is going to be the availability of reliable and affordable child care. Um, and, and, you know, we, we certainly have to appreciate that the female workforce, um, as employees, as business owners, as entrepreneurs, is, is bearing the brunt in terms of earnings, advancement, uh, mental health, work and parenting choices. Um, and so, you know, there's not going to be an inclusive recovery or, or, or recovery period uh, without the participation of women in the workforce. Um, and, and so it's, it's very important that, that we have child care in place because uh, women tend to, to, tend to bear the brunt of, of those responsibilities, um, which isn't necessarily the, 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 the perfect model, uh, but, uh, but, but it's going to be very important to, to address these issues. Um, you know, when we see the jobs numbers that came out this morning, too, um, that there is a bit of a gender divide in terms of recovery. Yeah. Um, you know, we like uh, uh, women work proportionally work more in the services sector and men work more in the goods producing sector. And as I mentioned, the services sector is taking longer to recover than the goods producing sector as well. Um, and so there are certainly some some inclusion factors in play as well uh, when it comes to recovery. Yeah, for sure. Um, and and because uh, this is just kind of one of my own particular. Uh, bugaboos, um, those are areas of provincial jurisdiction and uh, people keep uh, demanding that the Prime Minister do something about it. It's like he's already put 14 million on the table for, for the provinces to, sorry, 14 billion on the table for the provinces to, to access for things like childcare and, and so on. Um, and there seems to be some reluctance to that. So uh, that's just kind of one of my own uh, particular things in, in terms of uh, the conversation we're having around uh, the recovery uh, in terms of what federally can and can't be done. And it seems to me that we need to put a lot more pressure on, on premiers um, to pick up that ball. Absolutely. You know, I, um, and so that's why we actually on this issue work very closely with the provincial and territorial chambers of commerce um, because that is kind of the jurisdictional level at, at which it's at. Um, but, uh, but, but there are some really interesting examples of what provinces are doing. Like I know Manitoba is doing some very interesting uh, things with child care uh, within the context of the crisis. Um, there's some interesting lessons to be learned for, for some of the other provinces too by, by looking around the country. All right. Well, thanks for taking the time to do this. I appreciate it. No, thanks, Bill. 
And that's everything for this week. Join us again next week for some more Canadian politics. I'm Dale Smith. That's at journo underscore Dale on Twitter. And don't forget to like the video, share, subscribe, and support us on Patreon. Thanks, everyone.